So good to see everyone tonight. And real quick, a brief introduction to our guest speaker. Uh, Jane is the chair of the Nebraska Democratic Party, resides in Hastings, Nebraska, which in Nebraska is a city. Uh, however, it's definitely in rural Nebraska area. And uh, Jane, Jane is an activist. She's a grassroots organizer. She's a party chair. Um, and if you have read the book, you know that Jane was uh, instrumental in the work of Bold Nebraska, uh, predominantly focused on uh, fighting the Keystone XL pipeline um, and successfully stopped that. Um, and uh, yeah, and Jane has shared many other personal stories. And so Jane, thank you so much for uh, choosing to be with us tonight. Thank you for sharing your perspective and work through your book and feel free to add on that introduction, however you would like. Yeah, thank you, Wes, Jamal, and Kaz for hosting me tonight and everybody who's part of building bridges across America. We need more bridges. Uh, you know, Jimmy Carter said that we're given pieces of wood every day and it's our choice whether we're gonna put up a fence or build a bridge. And obviously the Trump Republicans, we know what they're doing. They're not only building fences, but they're burning them down as well. Uh, so we have to double our efforts, especially in our rural communities where it is often difficult. It is uphill, but it is worth the fight uh, because I like to remind people if we're gonna get past these razor thin margins in the Senate and in the House, and then of course at the local level, the only way that we're gonna do that is if we start winning in rural communities again. So I'm excited to be with you all tonight uh, to answer your questions and to dig into the topics. Thanks, Jane. And uh, I'm going to start kind of just with those variety of roles that you have played in progressive politics and still do today. So volunteer, activist, party chair. Um, what similarities are there in that work? What differences are there? What, what have you learned? Advantages, disadvantages? A whole lot, but just kind of speak to those multiple roles you play. Yeah, I definitely, and I think this is true for a lot of folks in rural communities, you wear lots of hats. Uh, so I know a lot of family farmers and ranchers, they're not only, you know, working on the family farmer ranch, they're also holding a job in town, probably for health insurance reasons. Uh, but then they're also helping at their church, they're on the school board, they're part of the city council. It's like in rural communities, you have to be a jack of all trade. And growing up, I lived in Fort Lauderdale, not a rural community. Uh, we definitely saw cows, but it was only on the way to kind of go to the mall where they had some open pasture and all those open pastures now are absolutely gone in Fort Lauderdale. I met a cute cowboy, which is if you're wondering how I got to Nebraska, that's how I got to Hastings, Nebraska. And the Republicans are very mad to this day that that meeting happened at a Young Democrats of America conference. But I think the thread that kind of brings it all together is I am a fighter. I believe that the little guy matters still in America and that the underdogs are usually the ones that have the best solutions to the problems facing America. And I've always taken the side of the underdog. So whether that was me supporting Bernie Sanders against Hillary Clinton in 2016, which is how I'm still on the board of our revolution or siding with girls who were struggling with eating disorders in the early part of my career, um, trying to really punch back against insurance companies and getting eating disorders included in mental health parity, or obviously the big underdog fight that we took on. We took on the Republican Party, big oil, not only in America, but big oil in Canada, uh, as well as a huge part of the Democratic Party when we fought the Keystone XL pipeline. But I really do believe that my deep commitment to community and to always listening to the people who are closest to the pain, uh, that that's always how we bring better solutions to the table. And I deeply believe that for the party as well. And we're not there yet as a Democratic Party, I have to say. Our roots are there. Um, our roots are committed to fighting for the underdog. But I do think that kind of corporate uh, Democrats have really gotten to the highest parts of our party and unfortunately still make a lot of decisions. So I think it's up to us at the grassroots level and in red states, purple states, blue states, uh, to bring that voice back so we can bring our party back to the people. Mm, thank you for that. And um, 
you know, I ha I've had the pleasure, I sit on the state central committee of the Nebraska State Party. And so it's been awesome to, I, I've known the, the club name uh, since I lived back in Hastings uh, before I could even vote. Uh, and then getting now to work with Jane uh, personally and to really see her work in action, it's awesome. And she really does stand for the people. And uh, you probably heard that as you were reading uh, her book. So Jane, and I know we kind of briefly touched on it before we uh, started tonight, but um, you mentioned several times in the, in the book about the need for more investment in rural states, particularly from the top, uh, the DNC level. And I know it because I've seen you tweet and you were very excited to see uh, Chair Harrison, um, you know, take that leadership role. And so can you just talk to us, you know, like what direction is the party as a whole going in and um, what are you thankful for in that direction? Yeah, so I am a big fan of Chair Jamie Harrison. Whenever you have somebody in the chair position who's been a state party chair or who's even been a state central committee member, uh, you would think that that should be kind of a prerequisite to be the national party chair, but it's not. It should be. <laughs> Maybe we should vie for a rule change on that. Uh, but when you are a state party chair, you understand all the different kind of dynamics at play. When Barack Obama was president, and by far one of the best presidents we had, and when I heard him talk on behalf of Terry McAuliffe uh, this past weekend, you know, I was driving in my car and I was crying because you realize what a moving leader he is and how much he kind of galvanizes the grassroots. But, you know, for all of that good, Barack Obama's team, not himself, but his team around him did not believe in state parties. They believed in kind of the model that you have a key figure in the White House and that person guides message and guides strategy. And so they created essentially a shadow party with organizing for America. So state parties went from 25,000 a year under Howard Dean to 2,500. So if you're a red state and you had $25,000 a month coming into your state party, you were able to afford two to three staff members. And that in an instant goes down to 2,500, you can barely afford one staff member. That meant no organizing at the state level, no uh, events organizing county chairs and even precinct captains or block captains as we call them to organize voter registration, no ability to have a fundraising mechanism to raise local money for things like voter guides so you can do mail essentially all the nuts and bolts things that state parties do well and do the best because we know our states and we know our counties. That resulted in us losing at the state level 1600 local offices, whether that was governors or other statewide offices or at the legislative level. That's not counting school boards, county commissions, city councils. So that's just at that level. That is a real correlation, right? A direct result of we stopped investing in state parties, all the money went to outside quote unquote progressive organizations to organize on progressive issues. The problem with that, and I run a progressive group, so I want money going to those groups. But the problem when we invest so much money and it's a lopsided essentially balance or seesaw is when we're doing voter registration, you don't have people talking to young people on college campuses or community colleges or at cultural events saying, this is why it's important to be a Democrat, right? Because Democrats are no longer have the money to actually do the voter registration. It's all the outside nonpartisan groups. So you have more and more young people registering as nonpartisan because that first contact with the first people of their first voter engagement is a nonpartisan activity. It's not somebody vying for the Democratic Party. So in real terms, we have to get back to investing in state parties. Now, under Tom Perez, who him and I agreed on lots of things and disagreed on many other, he brought that money back to $10,000 a month to all state parties. And Jamie Harrison continued the 10,000, but for red states like Nebraska, he brought it up to 1,200, 12,500. He also, Chair Harrison, along with a lot of the folks, including Ken Martin, who's the president of our State Party Association, they have created what's called the Red State Fund. So $2 million every election cycle is going to go to the 12 states that are red, essentially states like Nebraska that don't have a member of Congress or don't have a statewide elected Democrat in order to get us back to the place that we used to be. 
states like Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, we used to have uh, U.S. senators, members of Congress that were de Democrats, governors who were Democrats, not even that long ago, you know, six, eight years ago. So we can get back to that, but you can't get back to that if you're literally just hoping that you have enough money to keep the lights on in one office in your state. So money absolutely matters. And so it is a drumbeat that I will constantly be beating on. We are absolutely nowhere near we need to be. The red state fund that I talked about, $2 million, that's over every two years. That should be $2 million every six months if we're serious about really investing and be able to turn that table around. And um, building off of that, you know, what, what are you and the Nebraska Democratic Party doing to invest in uh, rural Nebraska? Yeah, so let me talk of like some nuts and bolts of what we're doing. One of the things that we heard from rural folks is one, we need organizers in our rural parts of our state. So we do have one rural organizer right now. And the funds that we're requesting from the DNC, we have a grant in for $150,000. We'll be hiring at least two other rural organizers and put them strategically around the state to help us win school board, state legislative races, and of course, help kind of the congressional races earn votes at the local level and go up. We then created something called a mobile office. This was something that had been talked about in our party for years, but we didn't have the resources or the focus to kind of get it off the ground. So we have now eight mobile offices that people can check out and request. And it has everything from a pop-up branded tent. So it's very professional, has the Democratic Party and our donkey on it. Uh, it has a pull-up banner, has all the materials you'll need voter registration, uh, voting information. We created something called the Rural Bill of Rights, which is in there, stickers, t-shirts, essentially all the things that you would need to table, but you, not, you might not have the money to pull all that together as a small county party. So that, those now are strategically placed all across the state and counties essentially share those mobile offices or staff kind of transport them one to the other. We worked hard on what's called the Rural Bill of Rights Kansas has done this, Missouri, I'm sure some other states have as well that I'm leaving out. But essentially we created, we have our platform of course, and we have a flyer called Democrats Believe because that was one of the things we got on college campuses was you know, what do Democrats stand for? So we actually created a flyer on what we stand for, our values. But then, then we created one specifically for rural communities. So on the front, it talks about all the policies that we stand for that rural communities are really looking to the Democratic Party to do, or you know, the Republican Party, they think that they're doing, but they're not. So things like we're we stand up for property rights, that we're against the use of eminent domain for private gain, that we believe in country of origin labeling, because that puts a level playing field for small family farmers and ranchers against big ag corporations. So very specific things that rural people take as cues that we are standing with them. The other thing is we have something called a block captain program. So we have almost a thousand across the state. And obviously the blocks in some of our rural communities are much bigger than they are in our urban communities. So in kind of concentrated areas, a block captain gets 50 voters. It could be Democrats and independents. And you contact those folks three times a year. We do training and materials before each contact. But for our rural folks, sometimes it's 25 or even 10, depending on how far those folks are from each other. So those are some of the kind of concrete things that we're doing. And in the chat, I can put the link to our NDP website that kind of describes each of those programs if you're interested in kind of replicating those. Yeah, and I, I, uh, I put the rural outreach link there. And, right. um, and I know Gina is on the call with us tonight and Gina has shared the link. Uh, Gina helps run uh, grassroots programs for NDP. And uh, I actually just got an email today about my block captain turf. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, it's a really cool program. Really encourage you to check out that link and, you know, maybe you can take some ideas to your, uh, your local uh, state party and um, uh, implement it there. If you, um, I put it in the chat, feel free to uh, submit questions. I have some here for Jane, but we really love <coughs> to hear um, questions from you all. And so uh, Kaz, you put a question in there and uh, would you like to ask Jane your question? Sure, Jane. I already touched on it, but um, 
But, so when I am talking to Democrats in rural America, one common theme that I hear over and over again, and so um, including from, from my daughter who lives in rural, rural Colorado, is um, I'm the only Democrat I know. Don't know another Democrat. And I'm like, clearly that's not the case. You know, I can pull up the stats for their, for their county and I'm like, clearly that's not the case. So how can, um, so you already mentioned much of these programs, how can these programs help um, other Democrats find each other and realize that they are not, um, that they're not alone? So how can there be more visibility of the Democratic Party um, in, in these communities? And then, yeah, how can, how can we make those connections so they don't feel so alone? One second here, gonna get Jane's mic on. There we go. Sorry, I have a cold. So <clears throat> I muted myself because I was coughing. So apologies. <clears throat> Sorry. So one thing absolutely is to do more visibility in areas. So when you're having a rodeo, a powwow, a county fair, kind of, you know, every small town has some kind of big thing that they do. For us in Hastings, it's Kool-Aid days. <laughs> so the Democrats always have a booth at Kool-Aid days. We always march in the parade at Kool-Aid days so people can physically see us. The other thing that we do, this was actually Gina's idea and she's brilliant and I love Gina. She's on the call tonight. She's our, one of our best staff members, uh, does a lot of grassroots organizing, works directly with Caleb, who's our rural organizer. So the other thing that we do is we send really cute postcards that are kind of kitschy. Uh, you know, it has like cows on it and has funny sayings. Gina comes up with them and designs them. We send those postcards to the county chair and they and we send them a list of the Democrats and independents who lean our way. And then we send them the mailing labels and the postage. And then the Democrats get together and they write messages to the Dems in their area. And I can't tell you that simple gesture uh, means more people are coming to county party meetings. They are getting a note from a fellow Democrat in their area that they didn't know that there were other Democrats. It means a lot. So that's another thing that we've been doing to essentially say, you're not alone, we're here. And then of course, being just really visible at these county events uh, that are kind of anchors in communities. Thank you, Cass, for your question, too. And one thing, uh, a huge shout out to the NDP team is, you know, you may have heard about the 30 for 30 plan. And our governor it literally went on the state, uh, around the state to all small towns, talking, uh, uh, spreading disinformation. And so the NDP did awesome job of hosting 30 by 30 uh, little rallies, informational meetings, and a lot of them were in small rural towns. And so I know that's another thing the party does that I thought was awesome. Doing that yeah. work that JD talked about to stop the spread of disinformation. Exactly. And we tried to make them fun. You know, we called them pizza and politics or beer and burgers, depending on where we were and what was available in that small town and just kind of made it a more welcoming atmosphere. So you didn't have to be a hardcore Democrat and attend a state central committee meeting in order to get the information. We were going to where people are. And I'm sure JD talked a lot about that. And it's one of the big lessons that I learned on Keystone XL that is translated obviously to Democratic Party organizing is you can't expect people to come to you, right? I mean, if we were to wait for people to come to the state convention, county convention or state central committee meetings, we would be in serious trouble. We have to go to the concerts. We have to go to the cultural events, uh, you know, organize these events when hot topics come up immigration, 30 by 30, critical race theory, and push back, not be afraid to push back. Well, and you know, that's a great segue into, we, we just read chapters three and four. Um, and so, you know, those, those issues where we can stand um, with uh, our fellow community members in rural areas, and then those hot button wedge issues. And so one of the questions I had is, uh, obviously, after the book, uh, Republicans and the GOP have used critical race theory as another way to establish fear and divide our communities. So um, since you didn't address that in the book, could you briefly uh, talk about that? Yeah. So this definitely came up after production of the book. It would have been something that I included in it. But honestly, it's the same as immigration. It's the same as guns. It's the same as abortion. It's the same as gay marriage. 
Um, I think it's really important as Democrats that we call out critical race theory and all the other boogeymen that the Republicans use as it, as what it is, that Republicans use these issues to try to divide us because they know that the economic policies of the Democratic Party are more in line with the majority of Americans. And that if the Republicans can keep us focused on these hot button issues to distract and divide us, then the Republicans can continue to give big corporations and the wealthy tax cuts and make sure that the imbalance of the economics at the local state and national level continue to be divided. So on critical race theory, we make it very clear that critical race theory is a philosophy that is taught mostly at the college level. Uh, and it is one theory on race relations in America that nowhere is this being taught in kindergartens or elementary schools. And that yet again, the Republicans are trying to use uh, one, one specific educational philosophy and say that therefore, you know, white people have no value in America anymore. And when some folks in kind of lower income white communities are feeling devalued and where jobs are moving out of their communities, this is where the Republicans essentially prey on, and we saw this during the Trump uh, presidency the most, rather than really addressing the real issues at hand. And you know, I think Dr. Barber does uh, the best that with the Poor People's Campaign, where he talks about this is not you know a white and black issue or a white and Latino issue. That this is a class issue. That this is poor folks who are constantly being preyed upon by big corporations and don't get a fair shot at the American dream that we all want. Um, so I think making fun of uh, critical race theory or trying to mock the Republicans that's never going to get us anywhere. That's the, also the same on abortion. I think when Democrats, it's easy to go on Twitter or Facebook and say that Republicans aren't pro-life because they only care about the fetus. And you know, when you know, you know, I see comments like that on Twitter and Facebook, that really doesn't do anything to move the conversation forward. If you consider yourself pro-life, um, that is a very personal label, just like it's very personal for you to consider yourself pro-choice. Um, there is often very much common ground, like even in Nebraska, 60% of Nebraskans believe that abortion should remain legal, but about that same amount of Nebraskans also consider themselves pro-life. So that could seem completely ridiculous to you and that that doesn't mesh, um, but there are a lot of pro-life individuals who do believe that abortion should remain legal, but they consider themselves pro-life. So again, meeting people where they're at. So when I am having conversations with Nebraskans that are pro-life and there is common ground there on how can we make sure that we're having proper sex education? How can we make sure that birth control is free to women uh, and young women in high school and college who um, are sexually active? And how can we make sure that you know, adoption is a viable option for individuals and not all this red tape that is often kind of weighing moms and dads down. So there's lots of common ground. Um, but I think as Democrats, we can't pretend to be Republican light because when Democrats choose to be Republican light and there is a Republican and a Democrat on the ballot, the Republicans will always choose the Republican. <laughs> you need to be honest about who you are. And if you as a Democrat are pro-life, then you should say that. But if you're a Democrat and you're pretending to be pro-life in order to try and get votes, voters will see through that and then they won't believe anything else that you say. So I was always very clear when we were organizing on Keystone XL that I was against the pipeline for several reasons. One, first and foremost, property rights. I didn't believe farmers and ranchers should have to give up their land by eminent domain for a foreign corporation. Two, I wanted to protect our water. But three, I was really concerned and am continue to be concerned about climate change. And the more fossil fuel infrastructure we build, the more climate change we are going to have. If I pretended that I didn't care about climate change, Republicans would have used that against me in the campaign. They would have told farmers and ranchers, Jane doesn't actually care about your property rights. She only cares about climate change. And the Republicans will do the same on other issues well. So we have to be honest about who we are as Democrats, make the case for the stances that we have, and then meet people where they are. Thank you so much, Jane. And um, seriously, if you have not bought her book, do it because Jane expands on these issues and many more, especially in those uh, chapters three and four. So 
Um, Peter uh, uh, submitted a question. And so, Peter, we will get your mic turned on. It may plop something up. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Hi there. Uh, thanks for your work, uh, especially writing the book. That's uh, so my question was, um, I live in a congressional district pretty similar to the Nebraska second, a suburban district in, I'm in Kansas, that's probably going to get cracked in redistricting and get sliced into several districts spanning uh, a wide range of communities. And do you just have any insights for you know, suburban volunteers in my case uh, to on specifically like door knocking and how to have those conversations go well um, in rural areas. Cause I think um, when the, you know, I can go out there and do it and read from a script, but you know, if it doesn't go well, the voter doesn't like it, I don't like it, we're not moving anything forward. So any, um, might just be some tips you have for us, but I'm all ears. So yep, thanks. Absolutely. So a couple things. One, you know, John Tester, I interview in the book and he's often known for saying, you know, you got to show up, right? And that seems so obvious and so elementary to what we're all talking about. So there's no question, just showing up obviously means a great deal to people, especially if their doors never been knocked on. And quite frankly, in a lot of our rural communities, their doors are not knocked on by Republicans or Democrats. And so showing up is critical. Being honest that you live in uh, so, you know, a suburb and that you're coming in because you deeply care about the voters in this area and that you're working towards XYZ candidate, I think is also important to communicate. If you can talk with Democrats that you already know in that area and see if there are issues that you can talk about at the door and that you can educate yourself on so you're not going in cold. Um, for example, there's a small town called Mead, Nebraska, that is now in the blue dot, the one that we call Jomaha, that everybody knows is Omaha, but in redistricting, they added a rural county into it. Um, and that is an issue that both Senator Tony Vargas and Alicia Shelton, we have two Democrats that are going to run for that primary, they need to now learn about that issue. Essentially, an ethanol plant was using toxic corn and has now polluted a lot of the land and water in the community. And Bold Nebraska is literally buying water filters for the community because the county, city, and the state has left behind those residents. That's something that you should know, for example, if you were going to knock doors in Saunders County, that Mead is a really issue on top of mind of everybody in that county and really wanting a solution. No matter what community you go into, there will be an issue that those folks care about. It could be their public school. It could be a rural hospital. Um, you know, there's lots of issues that impact rural communities the same as in urban communities. So absolutely try to talk to people you trust and know uh, to figure out what is the hot topics. And then at the door, ask folks. You know, some of the issues that I deeply care about are public education. I want to make sure that our public schools continue to rain, remain public and that they're not taken over by big for-profit charter schools. You know, what are some of the issues that you care about? Saying things like that, just like opening it up, saying what you care about and then asking them is also a good way to kind of bridge that conversation. Thanks, Jane, and a uh, great question, Peter. Appreciate that. Um, kind of similar question, but kind of going to the opposite side of our country. Uh, Leslie, we're gonna get your mic turned on so you can ask your question. Jane, I've been so impressed with your work and with your book. And um, I, there was a similar question from someone in Ohio. Some of us have states that are pretty strongly blue in some circumstances. What we have in Oregon is Dems are very, very, very strong in ritzy retirement, coastal areas, the cities, college towns, vast swaths of, and counties, almost empty of people, 1300 people in some counties, very hard to reach geographically. I get the impression they hate Democrats. So, I mean, we have all this strength here in the cities, but 
what advice would you give us to spread the word to our rural cousins? They might not have ever met a Democrat. <laughs> I tell a couple of stories in my book where I, you know, my husband had a story and then I had a story where I walked into a room of ranchers who were fighting a wind project and I was trying to come uh, talk about how could we get everybody to the table so they could create more wealth out of the wind, they could decide where the wind goes. You know, this is a constant problem that we're going to be facing in America as we build out clean energy. But when I introduced myself to the lead rancher uh, who was organizing the meeting, wow. he was like, oh, I thought you'd have horns and a tail. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, they... They have a lot of stereotypes about us. We have a lot of stereotypes about rural, like those stereotypes between urban and rural people kind of go both ways and stereotypes between Democrats and Republicans. Um, so my first is to actually start being present in communities. Um, I have been to a lot of rural areas in Oregon on the Jordan Co fight. Um, and yes, I got teased a lot by some of the folks who were fighting that pipeline about you know, how could a progressive Democrat, you know, come out there and actually care about them or their land. Um, but I do think that, that that really is the, you know, secret, if you will, and it's not really a secret, it's standing with people when they're hurting and showing up when they need us the most. Um, so that is absolutely critical. And honestly, Democrats don't do that enough. The last time that Democrats as a party stood up for rural communities really was during the farm crisis in the 80s. And the Democrats really stood up strong and pushed back against Reagan's policies and fought for rural communities uh, and had a lot of rural leaders at the national level as spokespeople for our party. And we don't do any of that anymore. Um, John Tester, I you know, kid in the book, but he is the tractor caucus of one. There's not a single other Democrat that's an active farmer or rancher from a rural community in the US Senate right now. Um, and that's a problem. It's not a problem because there's more people living in urban and less in rural, so who cares, which is sometimes what I hear national pundits say on national TV. It's a problem because rural, urban, and suburban America exist. It's what makes America amazing and a beautiful and diverse place to live. And we will not win statewide unless we start to win back rural voters. That includes in our blue and purple states. Um, so even in California, as you're looking at kind of, you know, the Gavin Newsom vote, you're beginning to see these pockets of rural get bigger and bigger um, because Democrats have stayed so focused on the areas that they're comfortable in. And Frank Lemire, who I, he's one of the people I dedicated the book to, you know, one of the lessons that he would always tell Democrats, other than it's important that you go collect road dust. And so, yes, that's what we all have to do. We have to get out there, get on those dirt roads and talk to people. But he also said, nothing's going to change unless you make others uncomfortable and unless you make yourself uncomfortable. Um, and so there are going to be times when you're in rural communities. And if you're not from a rural community that you mess up, I certainly made lots of mistakes when I headed up an AmeriCorps program. It was my first job out of college and it was in a hundred percent African-American school. And really growing up, I was raised in a predominantly white suburban community. And one of the first things I did was go to the principal of the elementary school, Bond Elementary. And I told her this fear that I had, that I was worried that I would be seen as this white savior. I didn't wanna be a white savior. I wanted to be part of the community. And she told me the same thing. She said, you are gonna make mistakes. Your foot is gonna be in your mouth several times, but the most important thing is that you're here. And that stuck with me throughout all of my organizing in any issue that I've worked on is that if you're really going to a rural community and you deeply care about those folks, it's gonna be okay if you make some mistakes or don't say the exact right words. But if you're there to bring their issues to candidates, and to get their vote out so their voice is more powerful, then that's what matters. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Leslie, for that question and for your passion to connect uh, with the rural part of your state. Uh, Maria, you put a question in the chat, and I think it's a good one. And so we'll get you your mic turned on. Go ahead. Okay. Um, 
Thank you for writing the book. I think it's uh, very important and uh, we need to speak to each other as people and, uh, and add sincerity to our conversation. Uh, but I was just um, curious about how Obama flipped nine states red to blue. I think it's part his sincerity, not simplicity because he's an intellect, but he wasn't of the intelligentsia where he left that space that 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 people erroneously perceived uh, Clinton uh, and where it was turned off by uh, Clinton's uh, campaign. But he had a certain level of sincerity and connectivity and maybe it's a personality thing, but he did flip those states because he did speak to people as people and he did reach out even though the Republicans were try trying to smear his, his, him as a, you know, an aloof elitist, it was just not true. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I did go to one of his book signings, but he went to book signings all over the place, not just college campuses, but he actually went in to, to rural areas and small towns and he, he, he sent his people and branched out. And I just wanna know, can we learn some of those lessons and, uh, and, and emulate it or repeat it. Yeah, so Obama yeah. led with his heart, which I think sometimes as Democrats, we rationalize things so much and that we want a perfect policy platform on every single issue. And we believe, because we deeply care about issues, that voters out there are gonna read our 10 page uh, plan on each individual issue. Uh, and therefore they're gonna vote with us because our ideas are so much better and they're so much more thought out. The reality is voters vote with their gut and with their heart. <laughs> and anybody that tells you differently has not been on enough campaigns <laughs> to know otherwise. That's what Obama really got. He told stories from his heart. He used growing up in a diverse kind of, you know, family setting uh, and not growing up with a lot of money to his advantage. He connected with voters on that level on, on so much. His Obviously his convention speech that he gave kind of wrapped everything up of why I think he became our president, that he never put people down. Um, when big issues on race came up, he addressed it head on as a dad, um, as in, and told the story about his white grandmother and the kind of racism that she had internally and how that made him feel and how they got through that as a family. So I think his honesty, I think his heart, I think that he didn't come from a rich family, that he had to fight for every position that he got um, really mattered to Americans, right? He was exactly what we imagine the American dream to be. And Obama never sneered at rural people. And you do see some Democrats who do sneer at rural people and who look down on them whether it's rural white folks or rural African-American, rural Latino, rural Native American, rural Asians. Um, but Obama never did that. He never did that. And I also think the way that his campaign really showed Obama interacting with kids really worked with women in a lot of states um, because they saw him as a loving father, not only as a strong leader on the issues that they cared about, but as a loving father. Uh, and that really mattered as well, I think. Not to mention they followed amazing organizing tactics of Marshall Gans and kind of deep canvassing. Um, so I don't want to discount that. Like they had a very strong organizing model that they trained their canvassers and organizers on and they deeply believed that and lived that practice. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Maria, for your question. Uh, really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, and Jane, uh, I, you know, Voters do vote with their heart and their gut, plain and simple at the end of the day. And so I do just want a quick shout out to CAS Leads, our leadership trainings. It's called Unlocking Your Political Power. You can do the exact same thing to connect with people in your networks. And it's just sharing your story, being raw and honest with folks. And, um, you know, so if you want to learn more on that, that I really suggest you attending that uh, brief training. Jane, we're getting close to, I think it's been a, oh, probably 45 minutes, if not a little more, but loving this. I, I do want to end just with this one question because 
we truly believe in joining in the work and uplifting the work towards racial equity. And so often um, that diverse um, voices that exist in rural America often aren't heard. And so could you just, uh, you, I know you talk about it a lot in your, in your book, um, can you just speak more on that and uh, maybe uplift a few voices or stories that you know of? Let's also just say the reality that a lot of our rural communities would be dead, ghosted without immigrants, Latinos, Native Americans moving in and transforming those communities. That includes Hastings, it includes Grand Island, which is now almost a big city. They've hit over the 50,000 mark. When I first moved to Nebraska, they were about 30, 35,000. That growth is all Latinos. Uh, the vast majority of new stores on the historic Main Street in Grand Island are catering to Latino families um, with amazing restaurants and grocery stores and quinceanera dresses. And there's just a, all the really blending of cultures, right? Um, our agricultural industry in ag states uh, would be dead without immigrant workforce. And farmers and ranchers know that, which is why, yes, I think Trump and the national party leaders villainize immigrants. But when you get to the local level, you actually start to see the kind of interconnectedness of the families because they all know that they are relying on each other in order for that community to exist, in order for their economic livelihoods to be moving forward. Um, so, you know, I work closely with a lot of pipeline fighters. And every single pipeline fight that we're working on exists in rural communities. <laughs> you know, the big pipelines are not going through cities or rich kind of suburbs. They're going through rural communities that they think have no power, whether that's poor white people or Native Americans reservations. And so, and so for example, Joy Braun, who's a Native organizer in South Dakota, um, you know, at first, Joy and I didn't know each other. I didn't know how to organize with and alongside, shoulder to shoulder with Native Americans. And we were really honest with each other in the beginning that we didn't know that. She didn't know kind of white farmers and ranchers. She thought that they were very greedy, a stereotype. And, you know, folks had stereotypes on both sides of that fight. But we started to do activities with each other, which is my really strong, you know, advocate, advocacy kind of to all of you is that we have to start having rural folks and urban folks do things together. So they start to build trust with one another, whether that's community service programs, whether that's getting them all in the same room to do postcard writing, but doing something together where they are working towards the same goal. Um, you know, whether that is a petition that's happening in your state to expand Medicaid or to get, you know, legalized uh, cannabis on the ballot, something that's going to cross the rural urban divide where you can get people in the same room and start to tear down some of these stereotypes where they're doing actions with each other so they can build trust with one another. That's exactly where we need to be as a Democratic Party. We don't only have to be focused on our candidates. We should also be focused on the issues that we know will bring people to our party. And then of course, always connect that back to Democrats, to our candidates, making sure people are registered and all the mechanics of voting that we sometimes take for granted. Thank you, Jane. And um, I love that. Uh, I know last week we just talked about what are ways, you know, you can interact with uh, rural citizens and, you know, here in Nebraska, football and beer. <laughs> That's a great way you can connect a lot of folks. And I know you share that story of just, you know, pulling up, having a drink with folks. Um, I wanted to end um, because I shared it earlier and JD Schulten um, mentioned uh, Frank Lemire. And so um, I put in the, uh, the chat, the link to Jane's book and then also to the NDP's Frank Lemire Grassroots Fellowship Program. So I know you spoke um, briefly about Frank, but could you just expand a little bit more so uh, folks could understand uh, who Frank really was and what that Grassroots Fellowship Program does? Yeah, absolutely. Frank was our vice chair. Uh, so when I had a lot of self-doubt, as I think a lot of women do in politics, about if I was qualified enough to run for a state party chair, I went to Frank and I told him that I didn't think I should run, that maybe I should run for vice chair and 
try to learn under, you know, a guy for a couple of years. And he told me, you know, that he was going to put tobacco down and pray for me. Um, but that he essentially told me you are second to no one and that you have stood up for mother earth. You've stood up for people who don't have a voice in politics and that it's your turn and your time to run. And I asked Frank to be my vice chair. We ran as a ticket. We beat essentially some powerful Democrats in our party. It was a close race, a hard fought race. Um, and we lost Frank about two years ago on Father's Day. And Frank taught us a lot of things in our party. But I think the thing that I carry the most is that he would always talk about the road dust on his car and the road dust on my minivan and how that was a real sign of a leader, that it wasn't somebody's fancy shoes or the type of car that they drive or the house that they live in, but it was really the road dust that they collect on their car. And if they are really committed to organizing people and caring about people and showing up for people. And that's what Frank was all about. He was the longest serving uh, Democratic member of the Democratic Committee, Native American. He started the Native Caucus at the DNC, started the Native Caucus here in Nebraska, and I'll forever be uh, in debt to the leadership stories that he taught me and that he lifted us up on. Thank you so much, Jane. And um, really would appreciate if you are willing and able to uh, support the, the party's uh, fel grassroots fellowship program um, in honor of Frank, uh, really appreciate that. Um, and there's been a few more amazing questions in there, but I wanna honor the time that uh, we agreed to. And I know you're not feeling quite the best today, tonight, so we really appreciate you sharing. But is there any like brief one minute, no more, uh, message you want to give to us tonight? Well, I quickly saw about how do we get fellow Democrats to stop sneering at rural folks. And I think one of the things that I try to explain to people is that if we are terrified of this razor thin margin in the House and in the Senate, then we need to bring rural people along with us. And when we create policies that have both progressives, conservatives, and moderates, urban, suburban, and rural folks at the table, those bills will always be better then if it's just one slice of our party making decisions of how we're gonna move forward on the big issues of climate change, on education, on healthcare. So that's my biggest you know, takeaway is, it is literally going to take all of us in order to bring our country out of the you know, place that we're currently in, where we don't trust each other, where there's so much disinformation, where you have Trump supporters yelling at Democrats when we're holding you know, state fair and county fair booths. We have to get beyond that and really start teaching fellow Democrats that we need rural people in order to get back to an America that is actually going to be something that we want to pass down to our kids. Um, so that's my lesson. Uh, we also can't build clean energy without rural people because they're the ones who have all the land. So <laughs> if you really care about climate change, you're going to need rural people caring about climate change too. Thank you so much, Jane. Really appreciate you stopping by tonight. Thank you for all you're doing, uh, not only for our country, but for our, you and I's uh, fellow state. Uh, truly appreciate you and really uh, appreciated your insight tonight. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the work you're gonna be putting in this coming weekend over in Virginia. We appreciate it because we they need it. So have a great night. Bye, everybody. Goodbye, all you fellow Dirt Road Dems and those who love the Dirt Road Dems. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks so, much. so much. See ya. All right.